Rebel Diaz, which side are you on? This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York. Sharif Abdul Kadus is joining us in Cairo. We are co hosting for this two hour special broadcast the latest news from Egypt. Hosni Mubarak has resigned as head of the ruling NDP party, but he remains president of Egypt. This comes as The New York Times reports the Obama administration and some members of the Egyptian military are now trying to nudge. Uh, Mubarak from power. According to The Times, the country's newly named Vice President Omar Suleiman and other top military leaders are discussing steps to limit Mubarak's decision making authority and possibly remove him from the presidential uh, palace in Cairo. Under this plan, Suleiman would head a transitional government. We also recently got news, actually out of Munich, but it was about Suleiman in Cairo that there was. Um, uh, we're going to get to that in a minute. To talk more about what a post Mubarak Egypt would look Look like. We're joined by Paul Amar, associate professor of global and international studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. With this breaking news, Professor Amar, um, what is your observation? Uh, well, this is very interesting. Uh, really, in the last three or four days, we've seen already this uprising or this transition uh, move through uh, phases that uh, would take years in a normal transition phase. We've seen the rise and fall of the police as the dominant responder to the uprisings. We've seen the rise and fall of the internationally linked, you know, kind of crony privatizing group of businessmen around Gamal Mubarak, rise and fall with the news 10 minutes ago that Gamal has left as secretary general of the party, being the end of that group, and also with the uh, attorney general, uh, excuse me, the public prosecutor in Egypt, now freezing the assets of the uh, the head of the privatization of hotels and the head of the privatization of the steel industry. We're seeing that what I think this shift in the ruling party just in the last minutes represents is, in a sense, a rise of certain businessmen that are affiliated with national development, which are linked to the military, which is also a very important economic actor in Egypt. I can comment on that a little bit if, if, if I have time. You do. Go ahead. Okay. So, what, who is now the new chair, the new secretary general of the ruling National Democratic Party, uh, is uh, Hossam Badrawi. Uh, he has the glorious honor of being the founder of Egypt's first HMO in 1989. He uh, basically founded the movement to privatize Egypt's healthcare system, which uh, is was universal and free. Uh, so that uh, is is something we Americans know a lot about. Um, so he runs very—he runs a kind of official state human rights agencies. So, of course, to be an official state human rights agency under Mubarak implies a lot of contradiction. So he is an interesting man. He's a businessman, a nationally respected businessman linked to kind of national health care capital in Egypt. Um, also, in recently this morning, we had a, a list of uh, demands or a plan, a transition plan laid out by Naguib Sawiris, also uh, probably the richest man in Egypt, who has many of the contracts in tourism development, infrastructure, uh, communications, um, building. And his plan is uh, basically to have the transition be governed by a bunch of, you know, very old businessmen and with some technocratic and scientific uh, members to give it this, what Tim Timothy Mitchell would call the rule of experts kind of coalition of conservative businessmen with the business wing of the Muslim Brothers and some scientists. Um, so that's interesting. I think what we're seeing is th this began uh, 12 days ago as a protest led by labor unions, by many of them women's-based labor unions in the manufacturing cities of Egypt, where new Russian and Chinese investment has stimulated the return of factories, the return of working-class jobs, often by women sweatshop workers. This started out as a a national, nationwide, basically, labor protest with human rights component, anger about the police, about police brutality. And now it's shifting in a kind of a businessman and the kind of businessman's wing of the Muslim Brothers movement in order to kind of just step a little bit outside of the neoliberal or, or kind of globalization-oriented mode into a kind of national capital development strategy with the military backing it. So it's very interesting. It's happening very fast.
Um, Sharif, tomorrow the banks are going to reopen. That is the plan. Um, uh, and, Professor Amar, the issue of their the divisions in the military, and could you see, perhaps, with the shifting role of the military, a kind of military takeover? Is that at all possible at this point? Well, the military is—has several different um, branches to it that we're now seeing this kind of interesting, confused expressions of this kind of paternalistic populism, protecting the people and doing, you know, doing a very important job of basically displacing the police and protecting the people. Um, this has a gendered component, and as you've seen, the reason why you have so many male protesters now is part of the way the military understands its protective role is to exclude women and children from political activity. So that's not a not a good sign. But the military has certainly been better than the horrible security services and police. Uh, the military is now in, in power. We have Suleiman, which is not from the army. He's from the intelligence services, which is nominally part of the military, but is a much less deep institution, has much less legitimacy with um, the kind of regular Egyptian folks on the street. He's more tied to, you know, Israel and the U.S. and, and international negotiations. And the day before yesterday, Soleiman's interview on national TV in Egypt was kind of like the Glenn Beck stroking your bunny moment uh, for, for Soleiman. He really was just nuts. He blamed the protests on a combination of Hamas and Israel and al-Qaeda and Anderson Cooper. And it, it, everybody just uh, thought that was just creepy and weird. So Suleiman is, again, things are changing fast. Suleiman is already losing his legitimacy, and maybe there was an assassination attempt today. So um, it's very interesting. But in terms of the military, again, the, 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 the more protective populist branch of the military is very powerful and is counterbalancing the police in, in a good way. But of course, these military leaders and are businessmen. The military run all, most of the shopping malls in Egypt. They run many of the beach resorts in Egypt. They make a lot of money through economic ventures, because they develop their military bases into tourism resorts and shopping malls and things, which is an interesting development. So that's why we have the military basically split between the question of its popular legitimacy and its economic interests. They want the protesters to love them as a military, and they want to love the protesters back. But they want to get the protesters off the street so the tourists will come back and the businesses will flourish. You mentioned the, well, now vice president, appointed so just in the last few days by President Mubarak, um, uh, blamed the media in part of the rant. Uh, right. We are also joined by Mohammed um, Dayem, uh, Mohammed Abdel Dayem, who is uh, with the Committee to Protect Journalists. Um, Mohammed, this issue of the number of journalists who've been targeted and the latest news of an Egyptian journalist dying, um, can you talk about what's happening? And you yourself are Egyptian. Sure. Um, the government continues to target journalists uh, through through these plain, plainclothes police and through these hired thugs. And it's really quite astonishing that we have the president and the vice president and the prime minister expressing various degrees of regret uh, in ensuring both the Egyptian public as well as international journalists they've spoken to that these attacks will cease, that they will do everything in their power to stop these attacks from taking place while those attacks are taking place on the street. Those attacks have continued. They're still taking place today. Uh, before coming to the studio here, I was on the phone with journalists. I'm trying to verify something like 20 additional attacks on journalists that took place today. So um, while, while the uh, intensity and the frequency of those attacks have gone down slightly, uh, I have to emphasize that they continue to take place. Uh, <clears throat> And, and the, the Egyptian st state-owned and state-controlled media uh, are, are no longer uh, engaged in, in the business of news. Uh, they're, in fact, they're no longer engaged in the, in the business of propaganda. They are right now uh, being used as an arm of the executive branch. They are there to, to propagate things that are simply not true. And let me, let me just uh, say real quick that the Committee to Protect Journalists, as, as a matter of policy, is actually not in the business of, of analyzing or evaluating um, editorial lines or the quality of news. We're in the business of protecting journalists. But state-owned media has ceased to be media, as it were, and is now becoming something uh, a couple of notches below propaganda, frankly. Uh, one 
top reporter at Nile TV, Egyptian t state television, just uh, threw it all in. She walked out and joined the protesters in Tahrir Square. She said she should have done it long ago. Correct. You hear, I mean, uh, who's, who's uh, an anchor on, on Nile TV, uh, finally said enough is enough and uh, simply walked out and, and, wa and joined the protesters. Uh, in Tahrir Square. Uh, I've been trying to get a hold of her. I want to talk to her. But yes, uh, and she's not the only one, by the way. There are numerous uh, presenters on, um, on, on Arabic language uh, programs that have done the same, have either resigned or have walked out. They have not gotten uh, the same level of international attention simply because they broadcast in Arabic. Uh, I know Shahira personally, and she broadcasts in English. And so uh, her, her story has, has, has made headlines. Tell us and, about her. Uh, well, she's, she's been uh, working for Nile TV for a long time. Um, she has uh, long complained, uh, per perhaps privately, about, about the editorial line at some of these stations. But again, I mean, prior, prior to this crackdown against demonstrators and, and against uh, journalists, uh, the editorial line was, uh, <clears throat> was, was perhaps uh, inaccurate, but, but it, one could still refer to it as news with a straight face. Uh, over the past 11 days, it has simply ceased to be news, as we, as we, as you and I would describe it. On Thursday, an Egyptian journalist named Ahmed Mohammed Mahmoud died from gunshot wounds. Egyptian security agents have detained Al Jazeera Cairo bureau chief Abdel Fattah Fayed and journalist Ahmed Youssef. Um, uh, Pro Mubarak supporters also stormed the offices of Al Jazeera and Al Hara. Um, Talk about the journalist who died. Well, the journalist who died was actually filming uh, uh, confrontations between uh, uniformed police, because this was, uh, I believe, on the 27th or 28th of January, when there were actually still uniformed police on the streets of Cairo and elsewhere in Egypt. And he was filming from the balcony of his home confrontations between those uh, uniformed police and, and demonstrators. And according, in fact, according to uh, to Al Ahram, uh, he was uh, he was hit by a sniper bullet while filming from the balcony of his own apartment. Um, he was taken to a hospital and, and he was in a coma for uh, for a number of days be before he uh, he died yesterday in the hospital. And this marks the first uh, fatality uh, in this in this uprising that is now on its eleventh day, uh, and it's 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 actually a quite unfortunate twelfth day of, of this uprising actually. Um, Ahmed Mohammed Mahmoud was a journalist working for uh, Al Tawun, the newspaper which is published by the state-owned Al Aram Foundation. Correct. Yes, he was, they, he was working for that newspaper. Have they spoken out? Uh, well, Al Tawun doesn't doesn't have a, a website, or at least doesn't have a website that hasn't been taken down by by hackers yet. So I have not been able to to look at at, at that specific uh, publication. But Al Haram has written about it. We're talking to Mahan Madayam, Committee to Protect Journalists, here in New York. He runs the Middle East and North Africa.